So, um, actually, to teach about uh, the death and death and life is a very uh, useful topic. It's one of the most uh, essential topics in in Buddhist practice, because the the Buddha taught that all of his teachings can be summarized into three basic um, trainings, which is the training of um, um, morality the training of concentration or the mind training and the training of wisdom. So you could say that Buddhism consists of ethics, uh, spirituality and wisdom. But um, uh, he also said that all of these three trainings and every single teaching he ever taught can be summarized by one single word, which is uh, not being heedless. Now that's a word we do not often use in English as I've understood. Um, but uh, it means basically that you are uh, mindful of what your purpose is, in what, what you think is important in life, and that you do not lose yourself in details and things that are not important. And uh, it means that you are heed heedful of of this, you know, the, the meaning of life and how important it is that we have been born as human beings to, to lead our life to the fullest of our potential to do as good, much good as we can and to avoid everything that's wrong. Now, this, this term, um, heedfulness, is, is a very old, I suppose it's a bit old English, isn't it? But uh, I don't think it's not used anymore. But anyway, um, uh, <laughs> Let's talk a bit about what, um, what that means. And uh, uh, this is actually uh, connecting what, what, what death means in Buddhism. And then we can move on to what it means when somebody we know dies. Okay, I just switched the PowerPoint on, but of course you cannot see it yet. Just a moment. Yeah, this is the one. Yeah, so all of you are now people from Newcastle. <laughs> okay. So this is what I've been just been mentioning. There are three kinds of training in Buddhism. These are, they always come back whenever you're talking about uh, some Buddhist teaching. Um, and the practice of the teaching of the Buddha, of Buddhism, it can always be summarized in these three. But in the West, we often think it's uh, very important about the, the concentration part, but we often uh, attach little importance to the part on ethics. But actually um, leading an ethical life is very important in Buddhism as well. But let's get back to the topic. When we talk about Buddhism, one very important thing uh, when we talk about uh, the training of the mind is not only about meditation, it also includes mindfulness. And this is something that we all are going, all learning about more and more these days, right? Mindfulness is a very, uh, very trendy topic right now. And there are even, uh, mindfulness magazines, mindfulness research centers. It's really one of the most emerging important topics in psychology of the 2010s. But uh, there is one more thing that is also very important in the training of the mind, and that is our habits. And uh, the thing with our habits is that we do not usually see them. And um, because of that, um, we often are not aware of how important it is to lead, lead a spiritual life. All of you have come here today because you realize it's important to, to learn about spirituality, to learn about meditation, to learn about how to practice your mind and character. But m m many people in the world, whether they live in the West or in the East, they don't think it's important because they are caught up with the daily uh, 
routine and daily concerns that they have. One important aspect of that is that we are used to look outside. All of us, even those who are uh, involved in spirituality, spirituality like you and me, we are very much used to look outside from the time we are born. It's actually really rather uh, inborn in us because our eyes are, by nature, are looking outside, right? Hardly anyone is born with eyes pointing inside. So this would not be a very good sign usually. <laughs> so when we are always looking outside because of the nature of our skeleton is like that, we tend to have a habit of always looking outside and learning everything about us around in the world, being concerned with a lot of things about us, around us in the world, but not so much being concerned with our own mind, our own character. And one other thing is that when we have certain habits in life, we get used to them, which makes it even harder for, for us to see our habits. Just like a fish is used to the water. And this is, uh, the Buddha actually uh, made this comparison. He said, uh, our, we are like fishes that are used to the water. If you ask a fish, what is it like to be in the water all the time? It won't be able to give you a good answer because it's always been in the water. <laughs> and uh, it will only know uh, how important it is to be in the water once you've thrown it out of the water. <laughs> and actually the Buddha made the same comparison with people like you and me when we are getting uh, to try to unlearn our habits. Our mind will struggle to get back into our habits when we are losing the comfort, when we are exiting the comfort zone that we used to be in. So uh, when we focus more inwards in our practice, we focus more, we learn to be more self-observant. We become more aware of our habitual patterns and we can improve on them. And this is where reflection on death comes in in Buddhism. So in Buddhism, death is like a messenger more than anything else. A messenger who remind, which reminds us of the value of human life. And this is not just a word that I invented to make it sound more poetic. This is actually the word the Buddha used. He, he said, he, he called it uh, the heavenly messenger. <laughs> of course, when we think about death, it's often something we'd like to avoid. I don't know about the United States, but um, I think in Holland these days, death is kind of a thing we have completely banned out of the picture. We don't like to know about it, we don't like to talk about it. And uh, when you look on television, you only see young people, you don't see that many old people. We have a lot of problems with anything that has to do with death at old age. And when people die, I don't know about the United States, but in Holland, when somebody is, is that has, is, uh, has died, he will be cremated or buried very quickly. Just a very short ceremony, maybe about half an hour. If you're lucky, maybe one hour or one and a half hour. That's it. Unlike Thailand, for example, where anyone, whoever, whatever poor, however poor he, he or she is, will be, uh, will have a ceremony of seven days which indicates, what does that indicate? It indicates how much difficulty we have in the, in the West to deal with death. And, and actually that's very much a pity because death doesn't have to be something negative. Death can be something positive, reminding us of the value of human life. And the other two messengers, age, aging and illness, remind us of our future demise, <laughs> our future dying. So, so um, this is the basic message that I'd like to convey. I'm starting with it now. I'm actually starting with the conclusion today, but it's, this is actually very important because um, um, uh, whenever we see, so, when we hear about the news, somebody has died or we hear about 
people around us who have died or who have problems, difficulty with illness or aging, we often have difficulty with coping with that. If we are more aware of that, we can see those things as a training. The people around us, the things they uh, experience, this is something which is still kind of in the safe zone because it doesn't concern us directly. But when we hear about those people, we can reflect on ourselves and think, yeah, this is part of life. It's old age, sickness and death. That's part of everyone's life. And there may be a few very lucky individuals who, are, who hardly ever get sick, but no one, no one of us ever escapes uh, old age and death. In Buddhism, we call death, we call by different names. In the Buddhist text, death is called passing out of the world, passing away, dissolution, disappearance, dying in death, and completion of time, dissolution of the aggregates that our body and mind uh, pass out or, or, or become dissolved when we die, and the laying down of the body. Okay, I'm going to just... Um, I, I have to add one more thing, which, was, which is actually in the Dutch presentation I made, but it, I have not translated that part yet. Some, many people are wonder when I talk about this, what does Buddhism teach about when we die? Does our life end or does our life end or, or, or not? And the answer as, as usual is not a very clear yes or no. Um, when it comes to life and death, that's often the case in Buddhism. <laughs> um, because um, when we die, we, uh, our body and mind, as we know it, they end. They become dissolved. But the mind is, has an energy with it. And that energy we call karma. Or you, well, just call it karma for the time being. You can also call it merit and demerit if you are used to these terms. And that means that even though our, uh, our living being, as we are in body and mind, ceases to exist when we die, we, 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 know, uh, we know that, 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 uh, that in Buddhism we say that that will happen. The energy which, are, which we have produced throughout our life by doing good, saying good things, thinking good things, and also the opposite, the, all the things we have done wrong, <laughs> all that energy will still affect us after we die. So in a sense, there is some continu continuity, but there is also something that ends. Um, I was asked by B not to go too deep in the, mat <laughs> in the subject matter, but just to let you know that Buddhism doesn't teach that everything ends, but also doesn't teach that uh, you continue to exist after death. That's why in Buddhism we do not use the word reincarnation, but we rather use the word rebirth, which is more... Um, has a more of a sense that something ceases to exist, stops to exist, and then something new starts. Um, um, there is actually a, um, a book about the, the kind of, which is very similar to the Buddhist concept of rebirth. Uh, it's, I think it's called Cloud Atlas. Does anyone hear about that? It's a bit- It was a uh, movie, right, Long Pete? Sorry? I think it's a movie. Cloud Atlas? It was a book. Oh, okay, it was a book. I watched the movie. I, I never read the book, though. Ah, okay. The, the movie is, not... is probably about the book. <laughs> yeah. I don't think anyone would come up with the same name accidentally. <laughs> anyway, that, uh, that book, it deals with many different lives, and they affect each other. 
but it's not like exactly the same person is reborn. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. In the same way, our life, uh, when I will die from this life, I won't be exactly Lumpi Sander anymore. But it's, it's the same in our own life, in this life. You can already look back when you were still young, when you were still a child. Okay, some of you are still young, actually. But, so, but when you were still a child, uh, you, you were different, but in some ways also the same. Okay, now let's, that's enough uh, identity philosophy for now. But let's just say that death is something important in Buddhism, but it's not something that we only should, that we should be afraid of uh, without reason. I mean, we shouldn't have any irrational fear of death. Mm. The Buddha, he compared, he said, our life is very fragile. And he compared this because the word fragile in, in, in the ancient Indian language doesn't really exist. So he had many metaphors, many ways to compare that. He said that our life really is very fragile because a drop of, it's like a drop of dew on the tip of a blade of grass. He said our life is like a water bubble during the rain. If you have, if you have, if it's raining and there is a water bubble that very quickly arises in the, in a, in a pool of water and then it just pops. <laughs> mm -hmm. A line drawn on the water with a stick, uh, which will usually not last very long. A, a river flowing down from a mountain. This is very much a sense of uh, inevitable force. There is also a few comparisons which are a bit harsh, <laughs> but just to, for the, for the, to give you the complete idea. He also said that death or the fragility of life is like a lump of spittle at the tip of a tongue. <laughs> is that the same? Do I, is that, uh, does that match with American English? <laughs> no? Maybe a spit, not spittle? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> or a piece of meat thrown into an iron pan or a cow that is led to the slaughterhouse. <laughs> These are comparisons that the Buddha made and um, uh, with that he meant that there is an inevitability about death. We can't avoid it. But there is also um, something about it that we do not know when it will come. There is something unknown about it. So in Buddhist text, we have the expression that uh, the death has no foretelling signs or death has no omens. In, in Dutch language, we, there, we used to say that uh, death has no calendar. <laughs> there is no calendar app that tells you when you die. Actually, there is one. Did you know about that? I, I accidentally got to know about a website that actually tells you when you're going to die. <laughs> I'm sorry about the topic being a bit um, odd today, but I guess it's unavoidable. There's a website that actually asks if you smoke and if you drink, and it asks you a few more other questions, and then it will calculate <laughs> how long you have to live. And it will start to count backwards. <laughs> uh, I guess it's a good uh, reminder in a way, but in fact, it cannot be predicted. Because uh, even people who live very healthy, they may, just, they may just die in a car accident. And there are some people who live very unhealthy, but they, for some mysterious reason, they live very long lives. That doesn't mean that a healthy lifestyle is not important but it's not the full answer to the mysterious question of life and death. And in Buddhism, we would say that it's also very important to look at people's <coughs> on the path. So death teaches us to come back to the topic of what I started with. Death teaches us not to be heedless or not to be forgetful, to put it in, in, in normal words, with regard to what is really important in life. So what do you think is important if you had only one day to live? 
What would you do if you had only one more day to live? What would you do if you had only one more week to live? And what would you do if you had only one more hour to live? <laughs> These are questions that are interesting to ask ourselves sometimes. Because um, when some people know about that they have only one more month to live or three more months, they will start doing all sorts of things that they regret they hadn't done before. Which, which is really quite a waste, isn't it? I mean, if we, we just think all the time that we have no security in life, how long we're going to live, then every day becomes very precious, like a new gift, a new 24 hours that is given to you, that is given to you and you can use those 24 hours to the best. So this is what the Buddha called being truly alive. And somebody may be physically alive, but if he's not aware of the preciousness of human life, then it's like he's already dying. So this is sometimes called uh, the, head, the essential teaching of Buddhism. And everything in heedfulness is included in there. I mean, all Buddhist teachings are included in the idea of heedfulness. So the Buddha, he said, just like an elephant, the footprint of an elephant includes or covers is bigger than every other single footprint of or of any animal uh, well yeah the animals that we know of <laughs> uh, in the present day are every buddhist teaching can be included in the idea of uh, heedfulness so you can see that the, the, the trend or the rate, the current um, fashion about mindfulness uh, being the essential idea of Buddhism and being the essential idea of leading a healthy lifestyle is not really that far from what Buddhism is actually really about. But uh, uh, heedfulness and mindfulness are slightly different. Mindfulness, uh, uh, is uh, mostly is a little bit broader in a way, but it, it doesn't have that specific focus of uh, having a goal, having an aim in life as much as heedfulness. This is my interpretation. Okay, so how to reflect on death and to talk about this will help me to connect with the question you were asking about your relative or sorry was it your, your your father right i'm sorry the question was about the father right yeah transference of merit long peak right right just i'll come back to that in a moment so before we understand how important it is to deal with other people dying we should understand therefore that reflection on death is not uh, a bad thing in buddhism the traditional advice is said, it said, reflect on death by every, with every in-breath and out-breath, <laughs> which is, uh, but this, this actually, I think you should in interpret it in a way that it should not, you should not uh, be estranged from it. That's how I interpret it. Shouldn't be alienated from the idea of, of that one, we all have to die one day. And, um, um, yeah, our abbot usually will say that thinking about every day, uh, thinking about death every day a little bit will keep you healthy and strong. <laughs> it may be, it's a similar expression in Thai language with saying that uh, 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 thinking about death or reflection on death a day, once a day keeps the doctor away or something like that. Okay. So this is about reflection on death. Now I'd like to show you something else. Don't know if it uh, will show clearly. Can you see this? Um, we see the PowerPoint slide. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, the transference, the water pouring. Yeah, okay. So just now I, I talked about how death is important in our own lives. Um, but it's also important in, uh, in our, uh, the, how we deal with, um, 
with death when it comes to us, the people around us. When people around us die, pass away, it will be a reminder of how precious life is. But it doesn't mean that we can't do anything with it, that we have no way to cope with it. We can. There are ways that Buddhism teaches that we can cope with dying. And this is a very important part of Buddhism. In fact, it's one of the most universal practices of Buddhism. And that when somebody dies, you can actually give some, something to that person who has died. And this is what we call the sharing of merit. And you just use the word transfer of merit. This is actually a, a scientific term, um, which is, comes from uh, scholars. It's not a word that is used by Buddhists themselves, but it's, it's very similar, but it's not exactly the same as sharing. <laughs> but we don't actually transfer merit, but we, we share a merit and the other people, person can receive it because he's also switched on the radio. But I'll get back to that in a moment. Okay, I'm just going to share again. There you are. So here you can see a picture, which is an old uh, book, an old children book uh, 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 from Sri Lanka. And you see a man who is pouring some water into a, a wooden or perhaps an iron bowl. And this is a, a picture from a Sri Lankan or Indian children's book. This is a picture from Thailand, modern picture of somebody who is doing exactly the same ritual, but with uh, over a thousand kilometers, kilometers apart, sorry and uh, in a different, completely different country. But these two countries and these two periods have something in common, and well, that is Buddhism. And uh, in many countries, uh, before Buddhism came, there was a custom to honor our parents, our grandparents, our ancestors, by putting something on top of an altar. You call that altar in English? Mm -hmm. Yeah, put something on top of an altar. You can still see that amongst the Chinese people or East Asian people in general. We, East Asians will normally have a picture of their relatives, their ancestors who have passed away or their parents. And uh, there will be um, uh, some offerings to them of water, for example, or of food. Right? Anyone, any East Asians today? No? <laughs> but in, uh, when Buddhism came uh, to Asia, they changed that custom. It's almost like they, they put the water from the altar and brought it back and put it on the floor. And the Buddha said that water, you cannot really give to somebody who's passed away. But what you can give is something that is not material. According to Buddhism, whenever we do something good, an energy will occur in us. And I think B, you often like to talk about it. So I, I kind of presume that everyone knows about this pretty well already. Uh, that is the, end, the power of merit. Um, now, let me go back. And merit is in, in, in the ancient Indian language is actually called punya. But since no one ever uses this word, uh, I usually just say good karma, which is something we are used to in the West. This word, this word is not very uh, strange to us. But uh, if you have, if you, whether you call it punya, merit, or good karma, it is the Buddha, he compared it with water because even though it's not material like water, it has something in common. First of all, uh, it can be accumulated. Merit or punya or good karma is something that occurs whenever we do something good. 
whenever we say something good, when we think something good, or we do something good, an energy will occur in our mind. And this energy, it will attract good things in our lives. Now, we might have heard about this idea before. It's also in the American literature, it's also known as the law of harvest. And I think there are similar ideas in the Bible. But in Buddhism, we believe there's actually a, a literal energy inside of us that attracts good things whenever we do something good. And that energy we call, uh, we call merit or punya, or just good karma. And that energy we can accumulate or can gather in, our, in ourselves. And the Buddha pointed this out because he wanted to say that it's important that good things we can gradually accumulate in our mind. Sometimes we think that the little small things, goodness that we do in our daily life, sorry, that they can't be accumulated, but they can. We can gradually gather or accumulate the good things we do in our lives. It's actually a very uh, inspiring concept to know that every single good word we say, every single good thought we sing, it kind of gathers up and changes your personality and your mind. Merit is something, or merit or punya, is something that actually changes your entire character and mind. It's like a purifying, it has a purifying aspect. In that way, it's also like water, because water, when we have a shower or a bath, we feel good and happy. In the same way, merit has this, this purifying quality to it. It makes you feel more clear in mind. It makes you feel more happy. Because whenever we do something good, we also overcome something wrong in our mind. This is the very, very essential idea in Buddhism that whenever we do something good, it, it doesn't only, um, it doesn't only make something grow inside of us that is good, but it also makes something that is not good inside of us less strong. Good and bad are always opposites like that. If you work on something good, the bad things inside of you will have less power on you, will have less effect on you. Another thing that the Buddha explained the nature of merit is that it's difficult to measure and it can dilute, I already mentioned that, it can dilute the bad things inside of us. The last thing that is very important and that connects us with the topic that we're going to close with today is that merit can travel great distance just like water. If today, what is the biggest river in Georgia. Does anyone know? Or do you have no rivers? <laughs> Chattahoochee River? Um, yeah, Chattahoochee. Lake Lanier. <laughs> Lake Lanier. Chattahoochee River. <laughs> Again, please? It would be the Chattahoochee River. Long Chattahoochee? Chattahoochee. My geography, knowledge about American geography is very bad. <laughs> okay, I just say the biggest river, okay? So suppose you, you put some water, you put a drop of water in the biggest river in Georgia. We never know, maybe in one month, that drop of water will have landed in Holland. You don't need to have Zoom for that. <laughs> It will just be there because water travels throughout the world. And the same way with merit. So merit actually, uh, hold on. Merit actually can travel great distance like that. So the Buddha, he compared, he said, uh, merit can travel a great distance just like water. So if somebody, uh, so the idea is that when somebody dies, we can do something with this energy. Okay, now I have to get back to my previous. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, in that way, um, 
whenever we die, which we have somebody who is very dear to us and that person passes away, this is some of the most difficult obstacles we can face in life. It can be a great suffering that is very unexpected and very difficult to deal with. And um, it sometimes also seems as though we, we feel something, some part of us has gone, right? But um, the idea of how to deal with that, using the idea of merit, is that instead of wanting to uh, have a person back, which is uh, the idea of like you're grabbing something, grasping something to get it back, you give something to that person. And in that way, we can deal with uh, some, somebody who's passed away better. So uh, the idea is that, and this is very universally practiced in almost every, in ev actually in every Buddhist country, is that you take some periods, for example, uh, 10 days or 100 days after somebody who's dear to you has passed away, or you use a certain day that's important to you, like Father's Day, and then you imagine that whatever goodness you've done, you dedicate it to that person, you share it with that person. And because merit is such an abstract idea, the Buddha used water to illustrate it and also in the ceremonies. So in many Buddhist countries, water is used to, uh, to, as a symbol to dedicate the merit. So you will you see that in the Thai temple over there, there will be uh, certain, um, uh, what do you call it? Well, this thing here. <laughs> Uh, I don't know exactly the word in English. I'm sorry. Water vessel. <laughs> sorry. I'm calling it maybe like a water vessel. Yeah, that that will do. That will do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't really think there's a word either that I can think of. When I was in Thailand, I remember like I went to like a few like uh, temples, and they'll have like big, big um, vessels and streams of water. Now oh, bigger than that. Yeah, like big, big ones where you know you have like the floating, um, like floating like lotus flowers and different like things. Um, so the particular temple I went to was one where they had the reclining Buddha. Okay. Um, and then they had, um, I remember they had one outside. You know, you pay to have like you know, you light up like a little candle and it would just like flow through the little stream of water. Um, not as with my friends. It, even now, I didn't understand it fully. But obviously, you know, with coming here, I knew it has some deep meaning to it. Now I see what it was mainly right. for. You know, I made sure I participated in it. Yeah. And what okay. high school was that? Huh? He what? was talking about his experience in Thailand. I think so. Oh, it was I, like a lantern that you put in, yeah, and you kind of like made a, a wish. Kid. Yeah. So it's like a big, like a big stream. So I have like or different like levels of water yeah. um, mm -hmm. and pretty much you would just like pay to have like a little almost like a lotus flower like, like a lantern and yeah, you put like a and there's a candle yeah. and you light the candle and you just light it and then you and just then leave it, it floats. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just float in the water yeah. mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that's the same thing as I don't think it's used for sharing of merits though right Loki when you have like the lotus I, I I I think you mean the Thai New Year, but anyway, there is there is different ways we can express. Uh, usually, um, in in ceremonies of uh, uh, dedication of merit or sharing of merit in in Thai culture, we use a, a small vessel, but uh, maybe different ways are possible. I'm sure that different Buddhist countries have different forms to express. Um, Japan. I know that Japan has very extensive ceremonies of uh, expression of that or sharing of marriage, for example. But uh, I don't know about other temples in Thailand. But I think usually they use a like a small vessel, which uh, which I just showed on the picture. In in Thai language, this practice is called Kruat Nam, and uh, it's it's um, there is no real translation for it except for do that ritual in which you throw the water. <laughs> so um, 
it's a very uh, nice way to express but don't forget it's just a symbol if you need if you don't have even if you don't have the water you, you can still practice this but the water is a very powerful symbol and we often do this during the blessing of the monks because this is a, a way that we can combine our forces the monks will do blessing in a way is a sort of resolve in which they dedicate their goodness which the monks dedicate their goodness to uh, the person that has passed away today we also had the um, um, uh, memorial here today and we have a uh, what we call peter plea every every month peter plea or sometimes it's in thai language they call it pupa peter plea which is a dedication of merit to your deceased uh, relatives or people who you are indebted to. And this uh, custom, this, uh, we do this every month. And in Thailand, it's also done every, every month or sometimes every uh, twice a month, actually. So this is also a way, uh, opportunity that we can dedicate our, our merits to our loved ones. Also, there is um, in in Holland, there is, for example, the uh, the date of uh, I think it's two new, two November, which we call uh, All um, All Saints Day. Oh, sorry, All All Hallows Day. Uh, I think you have it in 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 American Catholicism as well. You can check. <laughs> and All Hallows Day is is maybe even the origin of the Halloween. I'm not sure. Is that in November? It's derived from All Saints Day. Right. But it's maybe mixed with some, um, some pagan ideas. But anyway, All Hallows Day is the idea that um, we use one day every year that we dedicate our goodness to our relatives that have passed away. Even though in Catholicism, there is not the idea of the energy of goodness that exists in our mind as there is in Buddhism. There is also the idea of uh, religious merit that we can dedicate. Actually, the word merit is, is from Catholicism. It's not a Buddhist word originally. But these days, uh, if you search on the word merit in, on, on Google, you will hardly find any Catholic pages every website you will find will be Buddhist <laughs> because the word has more or less been appropriated by Buddhists these days. But uh, the, the, the idea is not alien to other religions. So in, 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 in Holland, we have this custom on 2 November uh, among the southern parts of Holland in which we are now. And so we, we invite the people in the neighborhood to come and join us and dedicate merits to our uh, relatives or people who we feel dear to, who we feel indebted to. In this context, it's also important to mention that in, in Thai, in, in ancient Indian language, we have a word called pupakari. Pupakari is not very much translatable, but it means those who have uh, done goodness to us first. <laughs> it sounds like a contest, right? But what that means is that there are some people in the world who are very good because they do good without expecting something in return. And although there are different opinions about this, according to the Buddha, this also included parents. So parents, there is always an aspect of giving without expecting something in return to, to some extent in every parent. So that's why the Buddha, he called our parents, he called, it, he called them Upakari, which means those who have done good first. And uh, that's why it's very important to, to dedicate our merits to them after they have passed away. We do not need to wait until uh, All Hallows Day or Father's Day for that matter. We can do this every day using some water, we do not need to have this, this very nice vessel like, you, like I just showed you on the picture. We can actually use a cup of water if we find that it helps us to concentrate. Uh, but we can also just close our eyes in meditation and help 
uh, and, and imagine our relatives, our parents, our other relatives, or friends even that we feel indebted to, or we feel a bond with, and dedicate our goodness to them by imagining them, their face, or imagining their name, or re remembering their name. This is the practice that we do in uh, Buddhism. It's very uh, important. Uh, it's widespread, universal in every country. And in some countries like Japan, there are even temples that are entirely dedicated only to the sharing of merit. So this is a very important practice in Buddhism. And as you can see, uh, it's, it's quite universal. And in, in, you can see in this picture. Oh. When we dedicate our merit to other people, they can only receive it if they are able to rejoice in that goodness. This we sometimes use the word anumotana for. Anumotana means to have a satisfaction in or to rejoice in or to be thankful for, appreciate, be pleased by it or to enjoy it. Sometimes we also use the word satu. I think you have heard this word a lot in our temple, <laughs> maybe even more than the word yes or no. <laughs> and uh, it actually just means approval, uh, satu. So um, these two words uh, indicate a tradition and a belief in, in Buddhism that whenever we do something good, we can share it with others, but only if they approve of it, if they agree with it. This also holds for dedicating or sharing our merits with those who passed away. It is, we believe that uh, if, those, if our relatives or friends have passed away, they are not open to goodness. They don't believe in it. They're very cynical or skeptical, overly skeptical. In, and they don't believe in anything good uh, that involves doing good or doing charity or anything like that. Then it may be difficult to reach them but we can still try. And in that sense, uh, there is a, a comforting uh, statement in Buddhism that uh, uh, even if we cannot reach them, the very act of sharing is already a very good thing to do. And I think that's very true because every time we share something with our relatives or parents that have passed away, we think about them, we respect them, we hold them in, and we, we honor them and whatever good they have done, we also will think about that. So in that sense, there is always something good about sharing our merits with our people who have passed away that we know of. So this is what I'd like to say about that. So death in Buddhism is always something we can do something positive with, even though it's not always uh, very, uh, doesn't always bring us happiness. It can help us to, uh, we can do something constructive with it always. So uh, when we are confronted with death in our own lives, we can use it as a reflection and a reminder of the value of our human existence. And when we find that other people around us who are dear to us pass away, then apart from, a, apart from it being a reminder, it will also be an opportunity for us to give something to that person. Sometimes something that we were not able to give when they were still alive. 